Good morning to one and all. The topic that we have for today is a summary trial. Now, I do not know about uh, the learned magistrates present here, the chief judicial magistrates or the judicial magistrate first class as to whether you've been really conducting cases under the provision contemplated for summary trial. <coughs> um, we all know that uh, under the Code of Criminal Procedure, the trial that is contemplated would normally be for the uh, Court of the Magistrates, the <coughs> Warren trial, the summons trial. These are the normal mode of trial in the Magistrate Court. And summary trial is the third mode that is prescribed. And uh, in the Court of Sessions, we have Sessions Trial. Now, what is, what is a, a summons trial or a summons case? Now, how does a summons case actually start? Now, if you see the concept, it starts from 260 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. Now, if you see, we will find that uh, the summary trial was contemplated right then also because of various reasons, including one is that uh, in petty offences, you don't need to go for a prolonged trial. In many of these petty cases, you could do away with many of the procedure prescribed under the CRPC and you pass an order or judgment, convict or acquit. And therefore this summary trial or the summary procedure came into being. Now, under the summary procedure, it was contemplated then, but uh, you will notice that over the years what has happened is most of the courts have been clogged with, uh, with cases and perhaps Ganto would be no exception <coughs> that uh, there are number of, n number of I think the cases under the Negotiable Instruments Act pending. Many of our learned magistrates here have already dealt with these kind of matters and uh, in my experience also I'd uh, tell you that just a moment. And in my experience, the uh, dealing with 138 matters of the Negotiable Instruments Act tends to take a little time because of a lot of technicalities involved. But I will come to that a little later. But what <coughs> I'd like to tell you all is that uh, the code prescribes how a criminal case should begin and how it should end. When a case comes to you, if you try it in a summons matter, you don't normally frame a charge. All you do is read the substance of accusation. The accused pleads guilty, you record his plea of guilt, and then you convict, go for sentence. And if the convict or if the accused do not plead guilty or he says that I would like to go for trial, you hear the evidence, give a party for cross-examination, record it and then you pass your judgment. Now this is a summary, summary trial. But now what happens in a, in a trial of, uh, sorry, in someone's case, but what happens in summary trial? Now in summary trial, also, there are certain procedures laid down, but uh, if you compare it with someone's case, it normally, sh it, it normally short, uh, it, it gives you a short uh, procedure of dealing with these kind of matters, and many of the procedure prescribed under the summons or warrant trial is removed. Now, I will come one by one, and if you see when it starts with 260, the Chief Judicial Magistrate or the Judicial Magistrate in, in context of our state, because we don't have a Metropolitan Magistrate, they are empowered 
I mean, if you if the High Court empowers them, they can try <coughs> cases summarily. Now the question would be whether can we all try cases summarily? Now, the answer would be obviously no right now because of the fact that uh, the Honorable High Court has not yet empowered any of the magistrate and I think this question had not cropped up till now because uh, and I'd like to, I think we are thankful to the Academy for bringing out this topic of such an importance at this point of time when we have number of cases, petty cases which are clogging our system that uh, has the Honorable High Court empowered any of the magistrate to try summarily? In my service career, I have not found any such notification and I do not know whether any one of you have seen this kind of notification or office orders of the High Court. Have, have any one of you seen? No. So I think this will be a platform where we can request the the learned director of this academy to make a request <coughs> to the Honorable High Court to pass such notification or an office order empowering the Chief Judicial Magistrates and the Judicial Magistrate of the First Class to summarily try these cases. Because you see there are a number of 138 matters of the NI Act pending in your court. Now if you want to try it summarily, you will not be able to do so because of this hurdle, a right in 260. Now the question may also crop up, can the Chief Judicial Magistrate take up without being empowered? Yes. 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 Why would that be used, madam? Uh, so because, uh, mm -hmm. like, uh, <coughs> basically, so the exclusion of... Uh, 260. Yes. Is only like in If you see it properly, whether it's my understanding or not, what, what, do, what, do you all, what do you all have to say? The others? We've heard Ms. Yola. You know, these are inputs, and I'm not saying that I'm right or wrong. It's a forum where we can discuss a lot of questions. So, but, uh, especially empowered in this, we have by the High Court. I think that uh, falls only in the category of GM. 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 Okay. Now, how I read this 260, perhaps you have that quote in your table as well. How I read this 260 is I did not see any word which you normally find it after each clause, that word or, or and, you know. So I thought had it been or, Chief Judicial Magistrate or, Metropolitan Magistrate or, a Magistrate of the First Class, especially <coughs> then I would have thought that it is only the judicial magistrate who cannot, without em being empowered by the High Court, take up this matter. But here I think, if you read it in a proper sense, even the Chief Judicial Magistrate will have to be empowered by the Honorable High Court before taking up matters under for summary trial. Now, why empowered? You know, the question may come up, why should uh, judicial magistrates and or the metropolitan magistrates or the <coughs> chief judicial magistrates be empowered to take up cases under, these, uh, under this provision? Now the answer lies in the fact that, <coughs> as I said, there is a proper procedure for summons case and a warrant case. <coughs> you, cannot, you cannot deviate from the procedure you will have to follow the procedure, but so far as summary trial is concerned, you have been given some leeway. The, the <coughs> procedure is not as rigid as summons case or the warrant case. And how you do it is the magistrate concerned will have some leeway to deal with these kind of matters where judgments are also not written in that fashion where the recording of evidence is also not done in that fashion. And therefore, the word empowered comes because of the fact that these are sensitive matters and if you do not deal it 
with a with a proper hand, it may result in injustice to one other party. So the answer is that the High Court will empower if the High Court thinks that the judicial magistrate concerned is experienced enough to take up matters summarily. If you don't have an experienced uh, person sitting there, if you have not taken up cases under summons trial or a warrant trial, now the question will be how will we take up summary trial? You know, So first you need to uh, begin with regular cases under the summons case, the warrant case, and then the summary trial. And that is the reason, I think, why there is the word empowered. Because otherwise it would have been any, any magistrate, take up any kind of matters. Why would there not be a provision for empowering a magistrate to take up summons trial or a warrant trial? This is a shortcut procedure and therefore I think there are some, some uh, checks where the provision, where this code has mentioned that there has to be empowerment. Now, what are the offenses that can be taken up summarily? Now, these learned judges can take up matters which are punishable for less than two years. Or a theft case, or a theft, it could be two, uh, 379, it could be 380 inside, or it could be 381. Now, where the value of the stolen property does not exceed rupees 2000. Now, when you see these, what you understand is that these are mostly petty matters of not much importance. And that's the reason why the, the procedure has also been made a shortcut. You know? Now, the third is, if you are receiving a stolen property, the value of which does not exceed 2000, 411, or you are assisting in concealment of these kind of property, where the value also does not exceed another 2000 rupees or it could be an offence under 454 for lurking house trespass to commit an offence or a house breaking or it could be lurking house trespass or a house breaking at night these offences or it could be uh, any case where 504 or 506 is involved abetment of any of the offences that I have told you as of now or an attempt to commit these kind of offences and lastly it is an offence under the Capital Trespass Act which normally we don't have it in our state I do not know of others but I have not really dealt with <coughs> these kind of matters now what is the procedure that you follow for summons case, sorry, for summary trial, is if you see, you'll find it under 251 to 259 of the code, which specifies summons case, how you deal with summons case. And it says that the procedure that you have to uh, take for dealing with summary trial is summons case back again. Now, but if you see the later or the latter provisions under this chapter itself, you will see that you don't stick to that summary uh, summons trial that which starts from 251 of substance of accusation and the thereafter. You don't have to stick with everything. There are some leeways because when you deal with summary case, uh, sorry, summons. I'm sorry, I'm, <coughs> I'm having a little, you know, a complication of summary and summons because of perhaps the similarity of the word, but. <coughs> Any one of you here would tell me or would know that when a summons case comes to your court, what do you do? The first thing is 251, right? You mention, tell him what the accusation is. You inform the person that this is the substance of your accusation. You don't need to frame a formal charge. You tell him, sir, you have uh, done this or let's say take an example of the of a person creating nuisance the police catches these boys brings to your court 
Normally it used to be under 34 of the Police Act when we were magistrates, but now you have Sikkim Police Act. I think it is 164. I do not. 169 of the Sikkim Police Act. So you, these people are brought. What do you do? You just tell. This is an offence. Last night, at MG Mark, you were dead drunk. You, five of you boys, and you were creating ruckus. You were creating nuisance, disturbing the persons in that locality. What do you have to say? You will say, sir, that is true. No, madam, that is true. I have done this. So what do you do is prescribe fine, 50 rupees or whatever it is. You pay, you finish it off. So this is the summary procedure that you are adopting. But what we are doing it, we are doing it through summons, summons procedure. We are following 251. So we are not, there is no deviation from the actual procedure. And in this particular summons, uh, summary trial, what happens is, though you are taking up cases which is not punishable for more than two years, but the sentence that you can pass is only three months. So if there are cases, even under 380, 381, 379, where the value is less than 2,000 rupees, I think there is a little... Uh, um, burden, or not a burden, but a little uh, reading, pre pre reading for the learned magistrates to do, is to segregate if there are these type of cases falling under the head that I have just spoken. Segregate in the facts and circumstances of the case as to whether at the end the sentence would be less than three months. If you feel that no, no, this case is a little serious case, I don't think we should, even if he is, later on, if he is convicted, it will not be three months, six months <coughs> is minimum. Or if you feel that, no, 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 one year is minimum because of the gravity of the offence, then what you do is you do not take it right from the beginning as a summary trial, though you are entitled to deal with it summarily. What you do is, these type of cases will go as a regular warrant trial or a summary trial case. Now, these are one thing that you should remember when dealing with summary procedure. So what if you want to uh, release the person by payment only a fine, but then there is no limit for fine? In this? No, you can deal summarily. This is sentence for... If there is only... Uh, sorry, if there are certain cases where which prescribes that you can either deal with this person with imprisonment or with fine, then you can impose a fine and then let off. Yes. But if you are in, if you intend to convict that person and sentence him with some term of imprisonment, it should not exceed three. But so far as fine is concerned, <coughs> you can deal with. It doesn't say, you know. Uh, if you if you see this chapter properly. It only gives you a little snippets of how the procedure is to be conducted. If you see it, actually, it is just only this much, you know. That procedure you follow is a summons case, right? Just give me a moment, I'll show it to you. See, if you see 262 of the code, what does it say? It says, the procedure for summary trial is that in trials under this chapter, the procedure specified for the trial of summons case shall be followed. Except, and I think I have not mentioned here, but that word except as in mentioned herein under, that should be noted with a little importance. Because this, I think, gives you, if you understand it properly, it gives you uh, one reason to distinguish your case from a regular summons case to a summary trial, as in hearing. Because thereafter, how you write a judgment is another provision. After the record in summary trial, how you write a judgment? Normally, when you write a judgment, what do you do? There, is a, there are certain procedures. Correct. The facts, the points for determination, you determine, then you give reasons for your determination, you know. You discuss the evidence 
And when you discuss evidence, what happens? You discuss the deposition, you discuss cross-examination if required, right? Because you have given the person the liberty to cross-examine under the summons or a warrant trial case. Now, if you see a judgment in the summary trial, what does it say? It says, you give the a short mention about the evidence recorded, of the memorandum of evidence recorded. You got my point? What I'm trying to tell you is, here in warrant and summary cases, you have a procedure of examination in chief, cross-examination, and so on and so forth. <coughs> but what happens here? 262 will not tell you. But if you see 264, which is judgment, it will tell you that you will have to record the substance of evidence. What was the substance of evidence? And a brief statement of the case. So, how do you keep a record of summary trial? The next question would come up is, how do you keep a record? Now, most of the high courts or most of the courts, if you see, they prescribe under their rule some provision for a summary trial. And there is a register maintained. In a register, what they have is these provision taken out from the court. Now, since we don't have it here, now what I advise you all is, <coughs> as and when the magistrates are empowered by the Honorable High Court, once the notification comes out, once you start dealing with matters for summary procedure, and if there is no register prescribed, I suggest that you all follow this provision of keeping a record of summary trial. Because the procedure prescribes that you should put it in this manner. The serial number of the case, it will be most of the time GR case in magistrate trial. <coughs> the date of the offense, the date of the report of the complaint, name of the complainant, the parentage, residence, offense complaint of, plea of the accused, finding sentence, final order, and the date on which it was terminated. These are the only record that has been prescribed under the CRPC for dealing with summary trials. So, so basically, there will be yes. a judgment with the final order? No, there will be a judgment. In summary trials? Yes, sir. There will be a judgment, but your judgment will not, uh, your judgment will not be a regular judgment where you discuss the entire evidence. So, the, what I know some of my friends in other states were doing, they just tick it in their order, or they tick it. They don't have like a separate. So that's like a final order. Yeah, it's like a final order. It's not even like a judgment. Correct. See, uh, you can either dictate an order, mm -hmm. but uh, what I suggest is when you dictate an order, you just mention as a judgment. Mm -hmm. Now you can, in two pages, take up summary matters because normally your order would just be about one or two pages. Under this provision, what you do is, when you pass a judgment, you give out briefly the evidence of your uh, of the party of the parties, and then you just give your findings, and that is over. It uh, you can finish it in maybe just about two pages, or sometimes even one page, you know. So, but it is better you term it as judgment because later on it may be challenged or various, uh, some, sometimes if parties are not really happy, you know, because some, most of the times you are dealing with 138 matters of the NI Act. What we should understand is, uh, we should not only be focusing on what I told you in the first place, under 260, that the cases of lurking house trespass or theft or so on and so forth, but if you see it properly, it says any offence which is less than two years. And there are other acts which have come later on which specially provides that notwithstanding anything contained under the Code of Procedure, this is the 
procedure that you will have to follow. Let's take, for example, the NI Act that I was talking about. Or later on, I will come to Food and Nutrition Act, you know. Or even DV Act, you know. There are many, uh, there are many acts which provides for summary trial or a summary procedure. And therefore, we should not only focus on 260 but for writing judgments, but when you write judgment, you should write uh, focus on the other cases as well. Let's say, for example, if you take, if you write only an order, I think that will be a serious challenge when you write a judgment for an I Act or a DV Act. Can you just write order and then say that this is the final order for my NI Act? Because NI Act provides summary trial. So what I suggest is just a terminology on the top, judgment. But you can follow the provision of 200 and 264 while writing a judgment. What it says is that a judgment in every case is tried summarily in which the accused does not plead guilty, the magistrate shall record the substance of the evidence. You don't need to write in detail. And the judgment containing the brief statement of reasons for your findings. That's all. All right. So, uh, I'm not so very certain, but uh, I, I believe in 2021 there was a judgment in the Almighty Supreme Court uh, saying that all the 138 matters Correct. ought to be uh, try summary. Correct. So, so in that case, sir, do we, do we follow, I mean, even though we are not empowered, mm -hmm. can we try 138 matters summary? No, right now, what, uh, as, as, as for, for 138, yes, 130. for 138, yes. Mm -hmm. For other type of cases under this, you will have to be empowered. But 138, the NI Act itself provides. I will come to that case. This is, I think, uh, the order dated 16th of uh, April 21. It is, a, it, is, it is an important order where the five judges bench of the Honorable Supreme Court, including the Honorable Chief Justice of India, then Justice Bob Day, sat and passed this order in uh, expeditious disposal of 138 cases. That is, in this particular case. I have a brief uh, record of that case. I will show it to you at the end of my presentation. But Ms. Rohini has brought out, I think, an important aspect which we will deal with. This is one thing. What I'm trying to tell you is, please do not confuse yourself with <coughs> other type of cases generally provided under the CRPC and or criminal trials and some special acts like NI, food adulteration, DB, whatever it is, you should not confuse yourself because these acts give you give you power in the act itself that you can try it in a summary manner. So you don't have to go back to getting empowered under 260 because the NI Act itself provides that a magistrate of the first class will try it summarily. All right. I will come to this. So these are judgments normally that you write under uh, for summary cases. Now, you will not find in this chapter of how to record summary trial uh, evidence. But if you see 274 of the code, it will give you <coughs> how to record the, uh, the evidence in summons cases. In summons cases, what do you do is, you will examine the witness and you will make a memorandum of the substance of evidence. Now what do you all do? Or what do you do we normally do? Is that we don't make a memorandum. We take it almost like a warrant case. You bring the party, put him in the dock, uh, put him in the witness box, examination in chief followed by cross examination. It takes a lot of time, does it not? Sometimes cross examination takes a lot of time under 138. But what do you do when the court provides? How do you deal with summons case? Are we, do you think that, are we not doing it in a little, <coughs> little different manner than the court provides? Because if the court provides that you can just make a memorandum, and what is a memorandum? 
right? Magistrates will tell me, right? Right, you know, right in a Ziffy that a memorandum, once you do your TIP, what do you do? You just make a memorandum of the TIP, of the Test Identification Parade. Now, how do you do it? You'll see that an application had come if it is a stolen property, that this was the property involved, I have given a date, falna falna, the witness has come. He was, the items were placed with similar other items, 10 or 20. The witness was called, there were two independent witnesses, identified, okay, did not identify, all right. Now what is that? It is a memorandum. <coughs> you are just giving a snippet, a summary, uh, a summary of what had actually transpired in the TI parade. Similarly, while recording the evidence, all you have to do is make a memorandum. You don't need to follow that procedure of examination, cross-examination, these and that. That is actually what it is. It is warrant case. And what we are doing is we are confusing in warrant case and the sessions tribal case. But in summon case, if you see 274 itself, it gives you that when you record, what you do is, all you need to do is you should make a memorandum of the evidence and it has to be signed by the magistrates. But if you do not do it personally by any stenographer, which we normally do, you make a memorandum of the evidence. The person stands in the witness box, he tells you this is the evidence. Of course, as a principle of natural justice, you let them cross-examine with some questions. If you feel that there are irrelevant questions, you can cut short. And then what you do is you record the substance of, make it in a memorandum that this is the evidence that was recorded and keep it in your record. Because later on what you have to do is, this substance of evidence has to be mentioned in your judgment, which I just told you briefly about. Now what happens in other, uh, what, please don't confuse, this is not uh, for summary trial, but this is just to draw an analogy or a comparison as to what happens in a normal trial. In a normal trial, when you do it for a warrant case or a sessions tribal case, when the evidence is recorded, you need to follow 278. And when you follow 278, you'll have to read it over. That's the reason why you write it at the side of your, of your deposition form, ROAC. Read over and corrected. Corrected to be true. Because 278 provides that in these type of cases, you will have to give an opportunity to the witness to read over his statement, his evidence, his cross-examination. And if he finds that there is some mistake, to get it corrected before he signs. Now come back to 274. For your summons case, which you will deal, do it for the summary trial. Does it provide? You can check your code. It does not provide that you read over and correct it. So what I'm trying to tell you is, some of the procedure that we are following, perhaps right now, may not be entirely correct. I'm not saying that it is wrong, but what I'm trying to tell you is, it may not be entirely correct in the context of disposing of cases expeditiously. Otherwise, what we are doing is we are just following the same procedure for every type of cases. Let it be summary case, let it be summons case, let it be warrant case. Our procedure will be warrant trial case. Isn't it so? If you see your records, it is all warrant trial. So, you can just uh, take a note of how you could record the memorandum of evidence and don't follow uh, the provisions for recording evidence under 275 or 276, but follow the procedure of writing a memorandum. Now, another question uh, perhaps may come to your mind, and it came to my mind as well, that apart from whatever offenses has been stated under 260, which I just read at the, in the first slide or the second slide, are there other offenses under the code itself or under the IPC 
where the magistrates are, can try summarily. Huh? <coughs> I have found that under 344, you can have a summary procedure for giving false evidence. Under 350 again, you can have a summary procedure for non-attendance or disobedience to summons. Now let us come to the NI Act. Yes. It's uh, quite important for you to uh, note 274 because normally we don't read 274 within that chapter or even for somebody, uh, even for someone's cases. Now, under the Negotiable Instruments Act, for offenses under 138 which is clogging most of the criminal courts in the country, including Sikkim. 143 of the NI Act gives you power to the court to try cases summarily. Now you derive a power right from NI Act of 1881. You don't have to go back to the court. Now for the court, it is only the procedure that you need to follow. Don't read 260, but read the other procedure. What do you do, how to? how you take up this kind of uh, NI Act. It says that uh, whatever is provided in the code, notwithstanding <coughs> that, the provisions of 262 to 265, the procedure, judgment, recording, this has to be, this has to be followed and it will apply to trial of cases under 138 of the NI Act. Now, another question that may come up is whether in all type of NI Act cases we need to take it up summarily, right? The question may come up that should we do all cases summarily or should we distinguish between the cases, right? Now, what happened in, I'm not trying to confuse you, please uh, pardon me, but what happened when I told you about those cases under the Code of Criminal Procedure. You cannot convict for more than three months. Now here, under the NI Act, it has been extended to one year, but will all type of cases fit into one year? It will not. Sometimes you may feel that this person is a repetitive offender. Now I have dealt with five cases myself, and this is the sixth one. If, I, if you don't teach him a lesson, then I think it will, he, will, he will come up with these type of offenses again. So for repeated offender, sometimes you may feel that one year is not sufficient. You may go to a maximum of two years that is provided under the NI Act. So if, a, if you feel that there are these type of cases, then you segregate right from the beginning of those cases which are which you can punish for less than one year, which you can punish for less than two years, because under the NI Act, I think it is, it is very simple to distinguish this right at the beginning. Because NI Act is not purely criminal, it has, it has civil uh, <coughs> characteristics, you know. And it is not that somebody has been beaten up, somebody has been murdered, bodily injury, it's, it's something not like this, it's financial. It's uh, purely financial, and when it is purely financial, what we try to do is we try to put the gravity of the offense based on the amount involved. That is the distinction, distinction that we make. Or 
we try to distinguish the gravity because of the number of cases that that person has. If you if you see that he has been coming regularly, this person, you just took this person's case one year ago. Now again, there are five more cases coming in his in the court. You will feel that no, no, I will not take up summarily. I will take it up in a regular manner because his conviction would result in more than one year at the end. So if there are these type of cases, then you have power to take up these cases. Not in a summary trial, but in a warrant trial or a other summons trial manner, all right, where you can punish him for more than, uh, for more than one year. <coughs> and you will notice, what does it say, 143? It says that you can exceed a fine more than 5,000. It doesn't bar you that it is less than 5,000. It says it, you, you can exceed 5,000. Because in NI Act, normally, it would be lakhs and lakhs of rupees that are involved. And that's the reason why they come to the court. And it will double when you finally convict that person. So I think this provision has come right here. Now, even under the Prevention of Food Alteration Act, 16A gives you the same power. Look at the language that is employed. It is similar to 143 of the NI Act. NI Act is of 1881 and this is of uh, 1954, but the language is almost the same. It says that you can try cases summarily under the Food or Nutrition Act as well. All right. But <coughs> the sentence will be an imprisonment for a term not exceeding one year. The fine has not been prescribed in this. This is another act where summary trial can be taken up. Now, this I wanted to take uh, a little later, but the slide has come right on time. When you take up summary cases, a very important point may come up. What about 313? No? What about 313? Because you were telling us that summary trial, you follow this, you don't do this, you just record the memorandum. And then what do we do about 313? Now, 313 is an, in, what you have to understand, is an integral part of a criminal trial. 313 is the time where the judge speaks to the accused directly, where the presiding officer gives him an opportunity to answer any circumstance that is not in his favor. The judge gives him a chance to convince the court that he has been falsely implicated or the evidence of that particular witness is in this manner and what he wants to actually explain or if he has any witness to come and tell the judge. Now 313, you cannot uh, do away with 313 even in summary trial cases. Now this is one case, uh, the judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court that I found which will put this question to rest that even for summary procedure, you will have to follow 313. All right? You can note it down, it's quite interesting and... All right? Now, this came in between, but what I was telling you is under the <coughs> NI Act, when you try summarily, now, later on, what may happen is the judicial offices, as you all know, we don't stay in one station for a very long time. We stay, that is, when, you, when he read my profile, you could see that I was in one place some time, some other place some time, and it's equally for all of you, mm -hmm. right? You are here one day and you are somewhere else one day, and this is a part of our job. So when you take up cases in the court, summary trial, you are trying it summarily under one, for 130 it matters. What happens to those cases where you are not able to pronounce judgment? You, le you have left it midway. It happens, isn't it, sir? You get transferred midway. The trial is in uh, the stage of 
substance of accuracy, whatever it is, the evidence is being recorded and you are writing the memorandum of evidence, then you are certainly transferred from one station to another. The new magistrate comes in your place. What do we do? In normal case, barring summary trial, you can continue. Even if it is at the end of the trial, the IO has been examined 313 over argument. The, the incoming magistrate or the incoming judge, even a sessions court, can take up those evidence, consider those evidence, and pass an order or a judgment. You don't need to go back or follow trial de novo. But for summary trial, you'll have to keep in mind that if a magistrate has begun summary trial, midway transferred, a new magistrate comes in, you cannot, in normal circumstances, take up that evidence to convict or to acquit. You will have to do it again. What does it, what do you understand from this? The understanding that I get is that you don't have a record like you have it in warrant trial case or a, or a summons trial case. You don't have the, uh, the deposition where there is examination in chief, cross-examination. All you have is a memorandum which the judge makes. This witness is examined, you make a memorandum, a short substance that number one was examined today. He has stated this. Maybe just about half the page. Now the second witness comes, you give half the page. So therefore, in summary trial cases, even under 148, you will have to do it again. Now this is the provision under the Code of Criminal Procedure, 326, where which says that conviction can be maintained on an evidence partly recorded by one magistrate and partly by another. But it has an exception in clause 3. Subsection 3 would say that it will not apply to summary trials. You got my point? I think you have some question. Is that you let me know because uh, what I experienced is that uh, we normally don't tend to look at these the other provisions. What we normally do is, if you see a summary trial, then we just see that chapter which contains about, <coughs> let's say, five, six or maybe seven, eight uh, sections. We don't look into here and there and what will be the repercussion, you know. So, this is one provision which is very important. I felt that if you have taken up a case for summary trial and if you go in somebody's place and you write a judgment, if that judgment is challenged in the higher court, the higher court will stuck it down. Not on facts, purely on law, 300 and 26 clause, uh, subsection 3, because it will say that you cannot take up the uh, evidence memorandum which was recorded by your, by your other uh, colleague, the predecessor. Now, the question may come up that should it be in all 148 cases? Because perhaps uh, there has been a little transfer here and there and you have gone to another station where you have seen that you know, the, my predecessor has recorded some of the evidence under 138 matter or DV Act cases. Now what do I do with uh, these type of cases? Should I again? Because you may be having, you know, you may be having a lot of cases where uh, uh, the former magistrate or the former chief judicial magistrate may have recorded and then it may have come to you by virtue of your being in that particular post right now. Because right, even me, I was transferred in February. Now when I go there, there are a lot of cases where the evidence has already begun. The evidence, half the evidence has already been recorded. Now what should I do? Now, so far as Sessions Court is concerned, there is no problem. Now, so far as 
Samurai tribe is concerned, there will be a problem. But you will have to make a distinction between those summary trial cases where you have done it purely summarily, where you have not recorded proper evidence. Memorandum you have mentioned these and that. But if you have followed a regular warrant trial or a regular summons trial, regular, and I am not telling you summary trial, in those matters, <coughs> the magistrate concern can follow and maintain a conviction even if the evidence has been recorded by the predecessor, your predecessor. All right? You have a question on this? Yes, sir. Yes. <coughs> so, suppose, while taking the, I mean, recording the evidence in the room, suppose if the witness uh, has passed away or cannot be found for any other reason, then in that case, sir, what do you do? Perhaps in that case, you can take up, but the court does not provide anything. But the common sense would say that what is already there on record, you can take it up. But the court does not provide anywhere that you will have to deal with this and you will have to recall. <coughs> because if there are some evidence of this nature where the witness has already passed away, it may happen, this is practical. I don't think there is any bar. And the bar would only be to those cases where the witnesses are right there, but you have not taken up you have done in a shortcut manner. In that case, in those situations, the higher courts will strike down on the orders of the judgment passed by the magistrate. And so another thing yes. is just the confusion. Because everywhere it talks about substance of evidence, memorandum and all. So what about the documents which are exhibited? That also we write in memorandum saying that this witness is exhibited. Yes, yes, you can write it down. You can write it down in your memorandum itself. Because what do you do in your TIP memorandum? Just draw an analogy. There are uh, material objects. Mm -hmm. There are uh, gold bangles. There is gold ring. There is a mobile phone. So what you do is you ask somebody to identify. And in your memorandum, what do you do? You say that MO1 or Exhibit 1 is the actual um, mobile phone. But there were similar mobile phones of other, other 10 mobile phones similar make, similar look, which are marked 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B, C, D, what, whatever it is. In a memorandum, you mention everything. So in this case also, it is not an exception. You will have to mention Exhibit A because obviously you will have to follow the provision of the NI Act where you send a notice. Say this is the notice, this is the reply, this is the check, this is the uh, Whenever there is a bouncing of check, this is the report from the bank. So these all comes as a vital evidence and you will have to record it as ex exhibits. Okay. So then we say, on being cross-examined, the witness said this. On being asked by the counsel for the complainant, he yes. said this. Yes. In many of these matters, yes. But, uh, yes. but uh, practically what happens? Most of the cases, when we do it, of this technical aspect, what do we do is you record in a proper form. You just, you just don't make it a memorandum. You make it in a question answer form or whatever it is. It so may run to. So, sir, does memorandum mean that we write it as, as a second person and not as a first person? So yes. Person. Yes. I could be wrong, but I am, I am thinking that this is all the more a long procedure than a normal <coughs> procedure because. The normal procedure is more easy. Because no, it is. Uh, verbatim. Correct. Now, after he said that, I have to think everything and then make a memorandum. So. No, see, what happens is uh, people are comfortable with uh, something which has been going on for a long time. Now, if you have done this summary trial procedure right from the beginning, you would feel that warrant trial is cumbersome. You know? Because you'll have to ask a single question and you'll have to put another answer. Uh, everything you'll have to record it in verbatim. So, the thing is, perhaps we have not really adopted summary trial procedure. We may find that it is cumbersome. Like, while dealing with two sentinel cases, I do think about this when I became a magistrate. Mm -hmm. But then, like, you know, I went to people judgment and I saw that they were done uh, the manner of warrant cases. Mm -hmm. 
No, I don't think uh, we need a clarification from the Honorable High Court uh, so because. Also in the context of a summary trial, sir, because yes. Like I think we also have to see in what context law was made at that time, uh, especially in the, uh, like we, we were talking about what <coughs> you know, police, uh, like you know, act case. Uh, now there is a notification from the Honorable High Court. It says that uh, like police act cases, specifically mentioned police act cases, uh, license violation cases, state license violation, violation cases have to be taken to the local level. So what we do is update it me and then the, uh, then we just inform them that okay, then you your case has to go to the high court. If you look at the nature of the cases involved in the local, some of them actually are summary. Trial cases. Tribal cases. And now people don't go around like, you know, mm. like, you know, basically these are public nuisance cases. So it's become very less because our society is involved. And the trade license are also like, uh, in fact, when I was in Seoul, I remember at one point of time, the incident office dropped at least 20 cases. Mm. And when we sat down <coughs> with everybody, all of them were like small time, uh, like, you know, one small momodoka or a fish vendor. Then we realized that actually those were uh, cases where they had applied for a trade like trade license, the agent's office, office had an issue with the license. Yes. So in fact they were not actually called. But then uh, we, we sent them to look at that and settled it like that. Now looking at the present context, especially cases like 137 and 379 and small small cases, we can have a notification from the office that these cases, these types of cases Right, somewhere. And I think, I think especially in Bangkok or Tennessee, Perhaps there could be yes, uh, uh, some clarification yes. from the Honorable High Court, like you have suggested. But in many of these cases where the code itself provides, I think the judges themselves can take up matters without seeking clarification because it empowers you. You know, as an independent. Uh, judge, if the act provides, if it empowers you to do it in this manner, just because it is being followed in, it was being done in this manner, doesn't, doesn't necessarily be that you would be wrong. If you follow the right course provided by the act, even if it is not the regular course which is being practiced, because see, precedent is not always correct. There could be wrong precedent and there could be correct precedent. Now what happens to a wrong precedent? And the wrong precedent, we tend to follow the same thing. And what happens is, at the end it becomes an established norm. But if you see it properly with the mother document, there will be a deviation. And here it's only a procedure. Like Ms. Jamia was telling me right now, that uh, don't you think it is cumbersome, it is tiresome to do it in this manner? Um, what I think is, if you want to do it in this manner or that manner, it is entirely on the magistrate. The code only gives you a guidance. It gives you a guidance that to make it shortcut, you do it in this manner. And if you do it in this manner, then you will have to follow, when you write the judgment, these are the provisions that you need to take into consideration. Uh, I think there are many exclusions of the Honorable Supreme Court that uh, evidence of the complainant and his witnesses can be taken as evidence on affidavit. Yes. So mm -hmm. if we take the evidence on affidavit, yes. it doesn't it make, I mean, uh, contradict no. the summary trial? No, no, no. Because the defense will have to be given opportunity to contradict, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. ask questions in each other district. Correct. Correct. See, so uh, no longer be a memorandum. No, you can have it in a form of a memorandum, but uh, there are acts like NI Act of 1881, where the, code, uh, where the Act itself provides that uh, you need to have your evidence in the form of an affidavit. Now once an affidavit comes, the person may just come and say that this is my affidavit. What he will tell you is that um, the evidence that I have given in my affidavit is true. Now, what is the reason that an affidavit has come in a criminal case? Because normally we do this type of affidavit evidence in a civil matter. 
The purpose is to <coughs> cut short the proceedings and to expedite the trial. Now, even following summary trial, what you have to do is the chapter for summary trial under the Code of Criminal Procedure has to be read in consonance with the provision provided under the NI Act. You can't read it independently. You can't just say that uh, here there is uh, affidavit and then we are doing it in this manner because later on what even the NI Act under 143 says is that the procedure that you follow is go back to 262 to 65 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. So when you go back to the Code of Criminal Procedure for following summary trial, then the procedure is this. Because NI Act does not give you a procedure of how to do it. It just tells you that it can come in the form of an evidence on affidavit. Or it should come in the form of an evidence on affidavit to cut short. They will not come and uh, you know waste a lot of time with the court. Simply they will examine themselves, but yes, you can give them an opportunity to cross-examine. Yes. Yes. But it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But see, uh, what you can do is when you are dealing in these type of cases, when you feel that no, no, it is the cross-examination is going a little haywire. It is not. This is not required at all. So in this manner, you can modulate the trial. You can't just give them free hand and say that you cross-examine on everything. Now, if you do that, then one cross-examination may take about an hour or a 45 minutes, at least for the complainant's cross-examination. You know. So if you want to cut short and if you want to follow some of the trial procedure, then you will have to modulate the procedure even for the recording of the evidence in your court. Right? Uh, there are some judgments which I'll discuss later where, uh, you know, the, the Honorable Supreme Court has distinguished, like I said, <coughs> about those cases where the magistrates have taken up in a summary trial manner or in a regular trial manner, if it has been done in a regular trial manner, though it has been mentioned as summons trial or a summons procedure, the intent of your uh, of your case, the whatever evidence that you have recorded, if it is in the regular manner, it may have been mentioned as a summary trial or a summary procedure, it will not be taken as summary trial. And then the succeeding magistrate can take over and continue with the with the case. So this is one another matter. <coughs> this is uh, the case that I was talking about. See, if you see this, you will find <coughs> this is a 2011 volume 9 SCC 638. Though under the NI Act it gives you power to try summarily, but if you see from the evidence taken that instead of <coughs> writing the substance of evidence, if you have taken the entire evidence One is this and there is another one which is distinguishable. One is uh, whether you can take up, like I said, from the from that evidence where the magistrate had left and the other one where you have done it in summary manner. Okay. This is one and the other one is 2014, Volume 10, <coughs> Supreme Court Cases, 494. I think this will answer Mr. Rohini's question, is where you have tried summarily, though you have said that you have taken up summary trial procedure, but you have recorded the evidence elaborately and defense is given full scope of cross-examination, 
Now such procedure is indicative that it was not summary procedure. Now, it was though it was tried in a summons manner or a warrant trial manner. So in such cases, the magistrate need not rehear case de novo and can act on the evidence of the predecessor magistrate. Okay, this is another case that is important. And uh, I will come back. I think it's a very difficult call to do. Yes, it is. But I think uh, we will, at the end we will discuss this, uh, the order of the Honorable Supreme Court where it says which Ms. Rohini was talking about. And I think that will clarify a lot of doubts. Now this is one particular case of the on, of our High Court itself, the Honorable High Court. Perhaps Ms. Ranjita will be better in a better position to tell us. But uh, what happens is, leaving NI Act or Food Alteration Act, now, even under DV Act, the Honorable High Court has said that even under DV Act, the procedure that you need to follow is summary trial. And this is Rekha Jain. Uh, you'll find it in SSC Online as well, 2022, SSC Online, Sikkim 24. It says that uh, the do under the Domestic Violence Act, the proceedings are under 12, normally 12 is the proceedings taken, or it may be 31 for punishment. It says that uh, it does not prevent the court from laying down its own procedure for disposal of application under 12 or 23. It also held that the procedure to be followed in dealing with a petition under 12 of the Domestic Violence Act is the summons case, is the summons case trial and summary procedure as provided in CRPC, which permits the court to take evidence. This is in a little different concept, uh, context, but essentially what it says is that in a, it can be taken up as a summary trial case, right? Now, there is another uh, act as well, after the DV Act. <coughs> the Honorable High Court says that even under the Motor Accidents Claim Tribunal, there are applications pending in our court, 140 applications, or 168 applications, 173. These type of applications can be dealt in a summary manner. That is provided under the CRPC, the chapter that I was talking about. This is SCC Online, Sikkim, 198, or you can also find it in the website, Mac Appeal, number 6 of 2018. Alright, this is another legislation that I thought it would be relevant to note where summary procedure is, uh, is taken up. Just a moment. Some more presentation, but uh, we may have, I may have missed it. The case that Ms. Uh, Rohini was talking about, <clears throat> this, uh, this is also quite important. I'll just try to find, okay, if I can find the substance of that particular case. Yes. So it is right here. Uh, this particular case is an order of the Honorable Supreme Court dated 16th of April 2021. This is in the case of expeditious disposal of 138 cases. And if you want to see the, the case citation, you can find it here. This is uh, Suomoto Red Petition Criminal, number 2 of 2020. <coughs> You got it? Have you all noted this? Mm -hmm. Now, what does it say is, there is one particular paragraph, two paragraphs in fact, which says that uh, there is mechanical conversion of summary trial to summons case. Because in, this is in the context of 138 matters, that most of 138 matters, the learned magistrates, though, 143 of the NI Act provides that you do it in a, in a summer, summons, uh, summary trial, 
but mechanically it is being converted into uh, summons case. Now this is the submission of the the uh, amicus and uh, one chapter nine uh, para nine. You can see it says that section one forty three of the Act has been introduced in two thousand twenty two as a step in aid for quick disposal of complaints filed under 138. And at this stage it is necessary to refer to chapter 21 of the code which deals with summary trials which we were talking about. In a case tried summarily in which the accused does not plead guilty, it is sufficient for the magistrate to record the substance of evidence and deliver a judgment. Like I said, you don't need to go for uh, examination, cross-examination, so and so forth. This is the order of the Supreme Court itself. You can record the substance of evidence and deliver a judgment containing a brief statement of reasons for his finding. There is a restriction that the procedure for summary trials under 262 is not to be applied for any sentence of imprisonment exceeding three months. All right. However, 262 to 265 of the code were made applicable as far as may be for trials of the offences under for, uh, 17 of the Act, notwithstanding anything in the court. Right? It is only in a case where the magistrate is of the opinion that it may be necessary to sentence the accused for a term exceeding one year, then the complaint shall be converted into a summons trial. Now, the responses were also taken from various high courts, and uh, it was found that in most of the states, or I think in all the states, there was a mechanical conversion of summary trial to summons case in 148 matters. Now it says that the result of such conversion of complaints under 138 from summary trial to summons case trial has been contributing for the delay in disposal of these type of cases. And the second proviso to 143 mandates that the magistrate has to record an order spelling out the reason for conversion. So if you want to convert if you don't want to follow that procedure of 143, first portion of dealing with 148 matters in a summary manner, if you feel that it is more than one year, you'll have to give your reasons. But it also says that what is the object of 143 for quick disposal of these type of cases. And the discretion conferred on the magistrate by the second provisor is to be exercised with due care and caution. This may not be very legible, but I will tell you. It says that they have accepted the suggestion of the amicus, and the High Court was to pass on. This judgment, I think, we have circulated amongst all the magistrates. So, so what I could understand is whenever a complaint comes, usually private complaint, yes. in cases. So from this paragraph, it is said that before moving ahead, so we have to first decide as a magistrate whether we can try this matter, if not whether, because this, as for this judgment, we have to it try It mandates summary. summary procedure. So then we have to give the reason why we Correct. are doing a summary. Correct. So, but then at that stage, how can we actually decide and how can we actually presume, basically, saying that, okay, in this, if the person gets convicted, uh, he will be punished Correct. with imprisonment of one year. Because after the evidence is recorded, after everything comes into place, then only we'll get a clear picture whether he, what sentence we have to give. Mm. So how can we at the initial stage only presume and then convert it? See, what normally happens is, like I told you earlier also, when a matter comes to your court, you know 138 matter is not purely criminal. Yes. Most of these, it has civil characteristics. It is only made criminal so that the money involved is returned quickly. What do we do here is, I think that is not correct, but we distinguish a case based on the amount. Now if the amount is 1 crore and above, you feel that this is a serious case. If it is 50,000, all right, 20,000, it's okay, you know, you can do it. But if it is 10 crore, oh my God, this is a... <coughs> This is a very grave, I mean, this is a very serious case. I think that should not be the concept 
all cases, whether it is 50 crores or 20,000, if it is bouncing of check, it is an offence under 138. It has to be taken up in the same, at the same level. But how do we distinguish right at the beginning is whether there is this particular case, it has come for the first time. You read the facts of the case, you know that in this case, the sentence that he may be, it may be imposed on him will be less than one year. Now there is a particular person you have dealt with just two months ago and after giving you a chance then has again come back with another bouncing case. Now there are five more cases coming to you. Now you deal with that five more cases and then again there are five another more cases of the same person. Now in these type of cases what do you think? You will feel that no, I think uh, one year is too less for this person. It should exceed one year. So in these type of cases, you can make a distinction right at the front, uh, right at the beginning. But again, if you cannot make a distinction right then, NI Act 143 does not tell you that once you begin summary trial, you should end it summarily. It doesn't say. There is a proviso. First, your uh, first course of action would be summary trial, irrespective of the fact whether you want to do whatever it is. Now, we have an order right now, which we have to follow. This is, as I said, five bench judgment uh, uh, order. You follow summary procedure, and in between, once you have started, you feel no, summary trial is not uh, justified. You give your reasons. And then what you do is, you convert into a regular summons case. Now, it doesn't bar the magistrate to convert into a, from a summary trial into a summons case. But, at the beginning, what you do is, irrespective of whatever it is, you will have to do it in a summary manner. Now, in between, once you start at summary trial, you cannot convert into summons case mechanically. By this order, what it says is that you'll have to give your reasons if you want to convert into a summary trial. Now the, now the bottom line is this. Summary trial is the rule and summons is an exception under 138 matters. So this yes. the procedure which we are following, and so everybody must be following right. uh, seconds, is uh, when the private complaint comes, then we examine the complainant. Yes, sir. We examine the complainant, the, uh, uh, evidence and affidavit and all is given, documents are exhibited, and then we take cognizance. So, uh, and I have basically there are timeline limitations, so we count that and all. <coughs> if everything is in order, then cognizance is taken. Cognizance is taken, then summon is issued. In the summon, we mention that if uh, we even give the inquiry to the then he, uh, so then uh, in the summon only we write, we give the bank account of the complainant also saying that after the receipt of the summon, if you desire to make the payment, you make the payment. Then after that the accused is brought in, he is called, he comes into picture, then he files bail, then the substantive acquisition is done. So till that period, is it a summary trial? No. What because essentially I can understand the from the procedure that you have followed, is perhaps a mix of warrant trial and a summons trial. So this is a concoction of the of the trial, the procedure. Now, what I would like to request you all is just contemplate. I'm not telling you that you do it in this manner, but contemplate whether the procedure that we are following is correct or not. Because what we are doing is we are following the precedent, like Madam said that uh, a precedent for your own, I mean, for your own safety as well, whether if you deviate, whether something happens, you know. But the court provides, or the act provides that you do it in this manner, why do we stick to our old habits? So with regard to the evidence portion, we understand now that we're supposed to, uh, like, uh, make this memorandum of evidence. But how do we summarize the initial proceedings? Like Madam said, mm -hmm. complaints are filed, exam, uh, the witness, uh, the complaint is examined, and then after the inquiry is done with regard to the jurisdiction, whether the office is in the same jurisdiction or not, and then the court thinks that summons is supposed to be uh, sent out, then we summon the uh, summon the accused, and the mm -hmm. accused comes, and on the same day we frame the essay. essay. But then, 
All right. so how do we shorten it more? I think, you know, what we can do is, when the complaint comes, when the complaint comes, along with the complainant, he files an application, you don't need to examine him at length. That is what we have been doing under 200, we have been examining him based on the, based on his, his uh, complaint. Normally we, we file evidence and affidavit, so we don't take so much time to examine. Okay. So if you don't take much time then, it also provides that later on you need not again examine that person. Once you have uh, examined once, cognizance is taken, issue uh, notice to the opposite party, the opposite party comes, you just tell him that this is the allegation against you which he understands, you note it down. All right, you don't need to note it down in a separate sheet of paper, but you can note it down in your order sheet itself. That this is, you don't need to frame a, frame a formal charge. But once he says that, no, I like to contest, you give him an opportunity whether you want to cross-examine this person. Because normally, if you say, normally, if you say that he doesn't want to, then you don't need to follow that procedure of cross-examination. You call them and the, again, you, you what he does is he goes to the talk, I mean the witness box, and he will say that this is my complaint, this is the yes, this is the uh, this is the check, this is the notice, exhibit, so and so forth. You know, it takes a lot of time. That is the first appearance. So after that, once the essay is framed, then usually the complainant's counsel only says that they rely on the evidence on affidavit which they filed on yes. the pre summoning yes. stage. So this is not done after the post summoning stage okay. directly. You, you, give them a, you give them an opportunity to cross-examine. Cross -examine. All right, I think that is the procedure, it's okay. That is the procedure. Right. Right. What, what, what is is the is the like, you know, even uh, like uh, lawyers, bar, everybody is uh, like, you know, so used to doing summer's cases. Forget about summary. Summer's case is in a warned manner. That in my, um, when I was starting off, I experienced this. That if you tell them that don't go so elaborate, they pick up them. Mm -hmm. That you know, oh, she's not allowing us to take, she's interjecting. So no. okay. I think we need a restatement of the okay. entire, in fact, the CRPC. Okay. The, and we already have a, a rule in place. You know, maybe we should amend and insert these things so that everybody knows. Okay. So, actually, another problem is I had read this judgment before. We, I had discussed with Vanessa also with regards to it. But we, basically, I don't know how to go about with yes, the summary trial. Start. We have read it, but. We have not understood so far because at the end it comes down to the same summon trial procedure only, exactly. which we have been practicing yeah. so and far. And when you go to summons, All right. is See, uh, my suggestion would be that when a complaint comes, you take his uh, evidence on affidavit, you need not examine him because the evidence on affidavit is sufficient enough. You will just read it once. You take cognizance of the matter, you issue notice to the accused, the accused comes, you tell him, you don't need to frame charge, you tell him that this is the accusation and if you want you can cross-examine this person. You are cutting short of that authentication and uh, many other things, you know, you are cutting it short. You just give one date. If he has, let's say for example, two witnesses, the witnesses' evidence is already in, exam I mean, in, in, in affidavit, they will simply come and start cross-examination. Now when they cross-examine, it is you who has to modulate the cross-examination. You can't give them free hand, you can't, you can't say that you carry on, you know, half day, you can't. Because what you are doing is, you are just trying to cut short the procedure. Now. If you want, you record it, but the, if you want it, you can also record it in the form of a memorandum. It clearly provides, it gives you power. The only thing is that we are not doing it because what happens, you know, what would happen later on. I said, you try it, let it be tested and let there be some orders or a judgment even from the higher courts because you are not doing anything wrong by, by, uh, recording it in the form of a memorandum, it provides, the CRPC provides that you do it in the form of a memorandum, but you are sticking to cross-examination, now that is your choice. If you are sticking to cross-examination, now that is your summons case.
you're doing it. Or a warren travel case. But here, if you <coughs> want to do it, you can just say, all right, these are the cross-examination. You can, uh, if, you, if they want, because see, this is not a criminal trial where the question would be spontaneous. The questions are already prepared based on your documents. 138, the questions are all similar. There are no spontaneous questions that you were there, whether this happened, you know, whether the light, whether the, uh, whether when the person was beaten up, did you see his face because of the light coming from here or light coming from there? There are no spontaneous questions in 138 matters. 138 matters, the questions are similar. If you, if you see the uh, similarity, it will be similar questions. On which date, whether this was given, whether it was bounced, whether you gave a notice. No, you didn't give a notice on this date. It has exceeded 15 days. Now, these are some questions which are vital questions. You take those questions, ask, record it in your memorandum. All right? Or what you do is you make a pre-format of these questions. You give me your questions, you tell the council. On the next date, you give me your questions. Now, because this is how you modulate your own uh, court. Now, but if you give him a free hand, then he will start questioning from that it is not true, that this is not the thing, and it is not true, that this is not the thing, and half of your uh, evidence would be filled up with just denial. Alright? Denial will take 20 minutes of your time, and the next 30 minutes will be cross-examination. So you can cut short. On the same day, you can examine, cross-examine, give him an opportunity to cross-examine that particular person, the complainant, as well as the witnesses. Then your evidence is over. Now what happens on the next date? If he has any witness to be examined in his defense, give him an opportunity of 3.13. Give him one uh, date for bringing his witness. In the form of an evidence on affidavit, you follow the same procedure one day, argument and over. When you write a judgment, you don't need to do that, make that entire procedure. So, this is my suggestion. Now it is up to the learned magistrates to take up. And, but uh, what I am telling you is, let us not be pulled down by what has happened in the past. Now when the procedure prescribes, gives you ample power, take a risk. Calculate it. You know, I'm just not telling you just a blunt thing. It gives you enough. Now there are orders of the Supreme Court itself, which is binding on us also, and the Constitution. So you deal with it. I am sure there will not be any adverse order from any of the High Courts or the superior courts. Because what you are doing is you are following the procedure of summary trial. And you are also implementing the order of the Supreme Court. So, with these I think I have come to the end of my deliberation. I cannot say a lecture or a program, but it's just my own understanding of the summary trial. I may have uh, missed out here and there. But before I end, I would just like to tell you that I thoroughly enjoyed today's program. It was not like when I sit there, because it is interactive, you know. When it is interactive, there is a lot of cross, uh, there is a lot of thoughts which are crossing. And even I have, a, I have taken a lot of questions to ponder over. I am not trying to tell you that what I have told you is absolutely correct. What you have to do is you will have to analyze what I told you, test it with the law and you apply it. Now what is, what I am trying to tell you is the suggestion that I am giving you on the points of law. Now when you deal with it in your court, you deal it in this manner and let us at least try, let us at least begin with uh, one matter. Let it be tested once and let, let us see. It doesn't matter, we make mistakes. But what we are doing is, we are, not making it we are not making a mistake deliberately. The court provides, we are doing it. Let us take it in this manner. If you have any questions, I will take it. Otherwise, we will close the session.
Yes. Amrit, uh, I think I'm very confusing with Dana and because I was just reading to, I think, what is it the accused is guilty in some way? It's not compounded. I have come up with a judgment. I don't remember exactly. Summary trial. Mm -hmm. Yes, in some way. No, summary trial, under, if you take it under 148, mm -hmm. per se, mm -hmm. it is compounded. Mm -hmm. But I think in general, I have come up with a judgment. I'm just thinking of... If you plead guilty. Yes, sir, it's not compounded. That's what, there is no judgment. So basically what I mean to say is how many trials are like very confusing. There is not much use to do some of the issues. Correct. If you see uh wrong. Uh -huh. Because compounding means acquittal. So mm. that's good. There is no judgment. Uh madam, can you repeat your question once more? No, sir, it's not a question, sir. I'm just saying that sir. Once compounded, yeah, I mean, uh, I think like you know, summary trial yes. has to be clarified through rules of uh, on CRPC. Okay. Because it's very confusing, sir. Mm -hmm. And like you cannot do it like do it like a summons case or a warrant case. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm given example where I, have, I think I've come across a journey where I'm not sure that I think so. Where uh, in summary trials, if one accused is guilty, it is not. That matter cannot be compounded. You have to actually do it. Once he pleads guilty. Yes. Sir. Once he pleads guilty in petty offences, under the Code of Criminal Procedure, once a person pleads guilty in petty offences, there is no appeal. Sorry, not guilty. No. I, no. What I understood is compoundable and non-compoundable. It is as per the offence, and Section 320 gives. It is not basically. I don't think compoundable and non-compoundable uh, can be defined by the trial. It is. But the offense which can be compoundable. 148 is compoundable, the Act provides. 380, 379, these are all compoundable, right? And uh, many of these matters, petty matters, are compoundable. So if they compound, that is again a different matter. Now again, there is another chapter of plea bargaining right after this chapter, which was inserted later on. So these are things which I think one should ponder. What the madam was trying to say is the terms of compounding can never be that the accused is pleading guilty. Because compounding itself is a No, no, no. I think you have confused. Guilty is another thing. Compounding is another matter at all. It's entirely, it does not, it does not relate. Because once you plead guilty, <laughs> means that you are accepting the case. But compounding is something that you come and then you compromise. Once you put compound, then you are discharged. Yes. Mm -hmm. Once you plead guilty, you are convicted. Once you accept compound, it's a future, not discharged. Yeah. All right. So, yes. I mean, in many cases, the uh, evidence of affidavit which is given is only when the court decides to uh, try it in a summons case. See, under 140, uh, under 138 cases, now. <coughs> The law at the present is that it has to be mandatorily in affidavit. The evidence has to be in affidavit and it has to be tried in a summary manner. If you want to convert it into a summary uh, summons case, then you will have to give your reasons why you are converting it into a summons case. All right? Multiple, like, suggested, like multiple cases are So can it be cited as a ground? Yes. You see, 143 does not give you a mandate that you will have to do it in a summary manner. It says provided. There is a discretion. There is a proviso. If you see, let's see, okay, I'll show it to you right now. of the NI Act, which says, you read from the proviso, provided that in a case, right from here, you know, provided that in a case of any conviction in a summary trial, it shall be lawful for the magistrate, uh, 
to pass sentence of imprisonment. Oh, sorry, this is not the one. Just a moment. There is one proviso which, which I have not mentioned here, but which says, if you see one, uh, the NI Act, it gives you a power, the magistrate a power, to convert a summary trial into a summons case if you feel that it is necessary. But uh, what was happening is that it was being converted mechanically. I mean, all the cases were going as a summons case. That's the reason why, under the, the order which we just referred, the Honorable Supreme Court uh, has now said that it has to be sum summary and summons will be an exception. Right now? Sissi Hung and uh, the other two here, you have not made any question. Not any, put any question. You have any question? No, Madam? No question. All right, if there is no question, I would like to close the session. And I'd like to thank the director for giving me this opportunity to, to uh, study these provisions for myself as well and uh, to have a meaningful discussion with all of you where I have also benefited from a lot of uh, inputs from your side. And I will contemplate from my side and I would like to request you also what I've told you to start with your uh, new kind of recording of the evidence, just try it once and let's see what happens. Thank you, sir. Thank you.